In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If anyone loves me, Jesus says, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our dwelling with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These words of Jesus mean that if you love Jesus, you will hold on to his word. You will keep it. And this is no easy task. There are battles on the inside against sin and unbelief, and battles on the outside that will push you into abandoning his word. The reason that the one who loves Jesus will keep his word is because it is the word that made him love Jesus in the first place. He has learned from the word that there is nothing in him or outside of him worth more than Jesus. And that is what Pentecost is all about. It is the day that the Holy Spirit fell upon the disciples. They spoke God's wondrous works in different languages to gather God's people together. And so it is about the preaching of Jesus' words. Jesus says earlier in chapter 14, Truly, truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. And the chief work is converting souls to God through the word. At Pentecost, we didn't read the lesson, but 3,000 souls were baptized and believed the gospel. That is a great work. The preaching of Jesus' words converted them. And this is the work of the Holy Spirit. It is through Jesus' words that the Holy Spirit kindles in us the fire of his love. And the fire of the Holy Spirit's love fosters a courage that is built on peace with God. The work of the Holy Spirit gives us courage in two aspects. First, it gives us courage in the face of a guilty conscience. And second, it gives us courage in the face of the world, which resists Jesus' words. So the words of Jesus then give us peace both on the inside and on the outside. They give us peace and thereby they give us courage. Now someone who has true courage must have love. Otherwise, it isn't courage but recklessness. And so a man who fights for his country has courage because he loves his country. So also, someone with courage in the face of his sins and in the face of the world is someone who loves Jesus. Why does he love Jesus? Because Jesus has given him peace with God. And this is the peace that the comforter, or the helper, the Holy Spirit gives. It's not a peace which the world can give. Jesus says in these beautiful words of today's gospel, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Now, you say every Sunday that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. And he does this in eternity. And this shows itself also in time, in that the Father and the Son send the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit speaks Jesus' words, and and Jesus speaks the Father's words. No person of the Godhead speaks on his own, because each person of the Trinity is one with the other. And so when Jesus ascends into heaven and sits at God's right hand, He sends the Holy Spirit from the Father, and the Father sends the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. The Spirit of God is also the Spirit of Christ. And there is no difference in what the Father says, or the Son says, or the Holy Spirit says. They all agree as one, and they show this to us in their words. Now, what does this mean to you? It means that the peace that the Holy Spirit gives you is the peace of God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives you the peace of God through, again, words. This is why Jesus says, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. The Holy Spirit alone can grant us love for Jesus, and he does this through words. Now, these are words which the world finds foolish, and so do your sinful flesh. This is the battle on the outside with the world and on the inside with yourself. Jesus says earlier in John 14 that the world is not able to receive the spirit of truth. And then Jesus says through his apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the natural man 
does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, for they are spiritually discerned. And here are the two fronts in your spiritual war, inside and outside, yourself and the world. And I'm not just speaking about some of you. I'm speaking about Paisley, who was baptized this morning. The Holy Spirit came upon her with the words of Jesus a little while ago. It was very simple, but it happened. God separated her from the world and made her his child, and so now she has entered into the battle where only the peace of Jesus, the peace that the Holy Spirit gives in his word, can prevail and protect her and preserve her. And I speak of the high school graduates who are entering adulthood with a flesh that is no different than Adam's, with a propensity to join the world in her rebellion against God and her indulgence in whatever pleases our flesh. I speak of the husband and the wife, of the single woman and the single man, of the widow and the widower, and all your various temptations and trials. I speak of Christians in every station of life who have received faith in Jesus as a gift from the Holy Spirit and are engaged in a battle that is mostly hidden from the eyes, but it rages on nonetheless. It is a battle on the one hand against ourselves because our flesh doesn't believe in Jesus. It quivers and trembles when God's law shows us that we are sinners who deserve to serve sin instead of God, who deserve to be given over to our desires instead of serving God. And the flesh's only recourse in the face of its mistakes is to try to minimize them and then make up some rules and overcome sin on our own. But that is only going to wrap us more tightly into our guilt and unbelief. And then the battle, on the other hand, is on the outside against the world, which not only seduces us and entices us to commit all sorts of sins against our parents, our bodies, and our neighbors, but tempts us to blaspheme God by denying the words of Jesus which save us from our sins. And this is a real battle. This is a hard battle. It is a battle which, as we sing in the Luther's Battle Hymn of the Reformation, with might of ours can nothing be done. Soon our loss would be effected. And so for this battle, we must have courage to fight. And to have courage to fight, we must have love for Jesus. And to have love for Jesus, we must have the Holy Spirit and the peace that he gives with his preaching, with his words. And have no doubt, whatever you see in yourself or outside of yourself, the Holy Spirit has the power to kindle in you light where there was only darkness. His is the power of Almighty God to call into being things that are not. Do not judge whether you have the Spirit by what you feel inside. It is true that you must know that you are a Christian, but do not always judge by what you feel inside. Judge by the words that the Spirit speaks to you. Jesus' words are, as he says, spirit, and they are life. Now, I'll give you an example here. Look at the Apostle Peter. Remember how he cowered in fear on the night Jesus was betrayed? His own natural powers didn't help him. John, no. He swore, Peter swore, that he would deny Jesus, or that he would not deny Jesus. He had as much resolution about that as a man can have. He said, even if everybody denies you, I will never deny you. But then what happened? When a little slave girl asks if, she, if he's one of Jesus' disciples, he denies that he even knows him three times. A grown man, afraid of a little girl and what she might say or do. And that is what we are without the Spirit, when we rely on our own natural powers. But look at Peter on Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit is poured out on him and the other apostles. He openly goes in front of the same people who crucified Jesus and proclaims not only that he knows him, but that this Jesus is the Lord and the Christ who suffered and died and rose again. Yes, and he even accuses the Jews of killing Jesus. So courageous and bold is he. And he says they need him. Where has his fear gone? It has been dispelled by Jesus. And that is nothing but the work of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and this work of the Spirit is the work of God's word which Jesus fulfilled and preached, and now the Spirit preaches through his apostles and his ministers and the scriptures today. Jesus says in today's gospel, These things I have spoken to you while I am with you. The Comforter, 
the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and remind you of all things that I said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. You see what is said here. First he says that the Holy Spirit is going to teach him all things. And then he says, peace I leave with you. The peace comes from the words of Jesus, which the Holy Spirit teaches. It is the doctrine that gives peace. Don't ever let anybody tell you that the doctrine doesn't matter. The doctrine matters. That's where peace comes from. It is the teaching about Christ that gives peace. And this is an important point. Your salvation is accomplished. Jesus said, it is finished. He conquered sin by dying our death. He conquered hell by taking its punishment upon him on the cross. He ascended into heaven and rules at God's right hand. But how does he rule? He rules through his Holy Spirit, whom he sends. He comes to us in his word. Salvation gained would mean nothing if salvation were not given. And that is what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit doesn't finish your salvation. Jesus did that already. The Holy Spirit delivers salvation in the word. And so wherever the gospel is preached, you know that the Holy Spirit is there calling, gathering, and enlightening the whole Christian church on earth just as he called you by the gospel and calls you by the gospel today. That was the purpose of speaking in tongues and all of the signs and miracles that God gave to his apostles and those disciples. It was to show that the apostolic word is the word of Jesus. It verified it. And so Jesus calls you again today with his gospel. He calls you knowing who you are. He knows the battles you face inside you and outside of you. He knows how you don't trust him as much as you should, and sometimes not at all. He knows how sometimes you barely feel the presence of God, if at all. He has seen you tempted and forget to call on him, and he has seen you suffer the consequences of it. He has seen you cower in the face of old sins that he already assured you are forgiven, but your flesh can never believe it. And that's what you feel, your flesh, and not the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Does your Father know you? Does he know how the world entices you and coaxes you to be afraid, to be silent when you are called to confess the truth? Does he know that you are weak? Then you should know that, you, that he is strong. And, he, and his strength is not that of a man who looks down on and despises the weak, but he shows his strength in his son as the power of the God who took on the weakness of man as his very own, who was tempted in every way like we are, yet without sin, only to take our sin upon himself. And yes, that is where the Father puts your sins, on the body of his son, who was on the body of his son. And there, God waged the war against the devil that you have never been able to win by your own powers. And there on the cross, God won. And your sin and the devil and hell, they all lost. And you hear this. And you come to know God. And you come to know him and you come to love him because he had mercy on you in your need. And he never turned you away. Because his love doesn't remain at the right hand of God, but he sends his Holy Spirit into your hearts with this peace between God and man. This peace that we could never accomplish, but Jesus did. And this peace with this word permeates everything that you are and have done. Every thought, every desire, every evil deed inside you. The devil, the devil can't point it against you because the Holy Spirit enters into you with the word. And he covers it all with the obedience of Jesus, every nook and cranny of sin, he goes in there and he scrubs and washes it away in the blood of the Redeemer. And he does this with the words of eternal life. They are words that are in your baptism that also now saves you by clothing you with Christ. They are words that join to the bread and wine, the body that crushed the devil's head and the blood that purchased your peace with God by paying your every debt. Come Holy Spirit, kindle in us the fire of your love. What fire is that but the words which tell me of a man stronger than I? Because he is also my God, who is one with the Father and the Holy Spirit. And so he shows me the love of the only true God, who holds my destiny and my life in his hands. And he will not let me lose the battle on the inside against my doubts or my sins, or on the outside against the disdain and persecution of the world. The words of Jesus are a flame that burn in a cold, hard heart until the ice melts and the stone is broken and faith is born again when before there was no knowledge or hope of God. And so we cling to the heat 
to the source of the fire. We cling to the words of Jesus. That is the true meaning of Pentecost. Whether we feel like Christians or not, if we would be Christians, if we want to face our sin down and show with our life and conversation that we love Christ and our neighbor, then we will keep his words of forgiveness and mercy, of truth and love. Whoever loves me will keep my word, Jesus says. Yes, and the Father will love him, and the Father and the Son will come and make their home in him. And that is what they have done in you. They have made their home in you. You have the presence of God in you. Do you still doubt that this morning? Maybe, maybe your daily life seems to yawn before you so wide that it threatens to overwhelm the words that you receive on a Sunday morning and that you struggle to cling to on a daily basis. Well, that's a good trick of the world. She tries to make you feel the world and your flesh more than you feel the Spirit and God. But if you cling to the words of Jesus, it doesn't matter what you feel. The joy will come after the sorrow. The courage will be born after the fear has been felt. Pentecost is a celebration of the word. You see, in the Old Testament, this is 50 days after the, Pass after the Passover. And it was the giving of the law on Mount Sinai, the giving of the Old Testament. And so it was a celebration of the giving of the word. And so Pentecost today is a celebration of the giving of the New Testament to the apostles and to the apostolic church. And so today we celebrate this New Testament. This is the New Testament in my blood, Jesus says. That is the voice of God Almighty. Don't be deceived into thinking that words, words are too simple to be of any good. It is the simple word of God that makes his promise so certain for you. God has not promised that Christians today will speak in tongues and do miracles like he gave his apostles to do on that first Pentecost. But God has promised that the words of those apostles, which their miracles confirmed, that this word has power over your conscience and over the world which threatens you. And when the latest spiritual fads fade away, when the popular and the powerful of this world are long forgotten and ashamed, when the grave has shut up all your accusers, you will still be alive. And all the good that God has done through you will no longer, will no longer be spangled with sin. It will be as pure as Jesus is now. Because whoever keeps Jesus' words not only loves Jesus, but has everything that Jesus has. He will never see death because he has won the battle with the faith the Holy Spirit kindled in his heart through his word. And he has fought with courage, with the courage that only the Comforter can give when he teaches us that God really is at peace with us. And we really are at peace with God. Amen. peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.